I'm sure you've all enjoyed your lunch. I'd like to begin now with an introduction of today's uh, speaker to the Economics Club of Indiana. Roger W. Ferguson, Jr. is President and Chief Executive Officer of TIAA, the leading provider of retirement services in the academic, research, medical, and cultural fields, and a Fortune 100 financial services organization. Today, five million people entrust their money to TIAA, which has maintained a stellar reputation for managing its clients' assets for centuries. Dr. Ferguson holds a bachelor's degree, a, a JD, and a PhD in economics, all from Harvard University. He began his career as an attorney at the New York City office of Davis Polk and Wardell, and from 1984 to 1997, he was an associate and partner at McKenzie & Company. Prior to joining TIAA in April 2008, Ferguson was head of financial services for Swiss Re, the world's second largest reinsurer, and, and prior to that, he served as vice chairman of the Board of Governors of the U.S. Federal Reserve System. As the only governor in Washington, D.C. on 9-11, he led the Fed's initial response to the terrorist attacks, taking actions that kept the U.S. financial system functioning while reassuring global financial community that the U.S. economy would not be paralyzed. Roger is active on several boards, including the Smithsonian Institution Board of Regents, Alphabet, the parent company of Google, and General Mills, just to name a few. Dr. Ferguson served on President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness, as well as its predecessor, the Economic Recovery Advisory Board. And he co-chaired the National Academy of Sciences Committee on the long-run macroeconomic effects of U.S. aging on the population. As a renowned economist, Roger Ferguson is a firm believer in the lifelong impact of education and financial literacy. As a reminder to all of you during the, today's uh, discussion, please use the white cards on your table if you have a question for today's guest, uh, and someone will pick them up, or tweet to us at Economic Club IN. Please join me in welcoming Roger to the stage. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Good to see you. All right. So Roger, uh, you know, TIA is a major company. It's got a great and distinguished history. But it's also changing. Uh, you've picked up some new, uh, some, some, some new tools, uh, tools for your toolkit. You've, um, you've uh, picked up Nuveen Investments and Everbank in the last couple of years. So can you tell our audience, some of whom may not know as much about TIA, what your history and, 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 your, and your mission are and, and how you see TIA unfolding under your leadership? Sure. Thank you. And uh, thanks to everyone here for coming. I'm, I'm humbled and impressed with the size of the audience, I must say. So uh, TIAA, we're not a publicly traded company, but we do have a storied history. Uh, as Greg said in the introduction, we're over 100 years old. Um, and we were started in 1918 by Andrew Carnegie, uh, the great industrialist. He was on the board of, of Cornell University, and he saw faculty and staff there uh, retiring uh, literally into poverty, some people literally working uh, to the last minute uh, because they didn't have enough resources to retire safely. And so he and a bunch of his uh, very foresighted colleagues created the concept of TIAA. Uh, and now it's 15 years before Social Security, if you could imagine that. So the idea behind our company is that individuals would save, uh, their employer, the university, would put some money in. It would be professionally invested uh, and managed by the TIA uh, uh, employees or our staff. And then when people retired, we'd give them a guaranteed income for life through the form of an annuity. So that's the essence of the company. Uh, it's evolved and changed. Um, and so in 1952, uh, we added another big product called CREF, which was the first um, um, equity-oriented variable annuity. Uh, and, and so that's, that was sort of the essence of the organization. Uh, so from the original million dollars or so that Carnegie uh, gave us, it's now uh, up to, we now manage $1.2 trillion. You heard Greg talk about 5 million individuals that we serve, 15,000 institutions. Uh, so Greg has talked about some of the changes we've made. So recently we did purchase um, uh, a bank in Florida called Everbank. 
We purchased a company called Nuveen, which does money management, asset management as well. And the point of all of these uh, activities is we recognize uh, two things. First is um, our motto has been getting people safely to and through retirement. Well, you can't get pay people safely to and through retirement if, if everything else is uncertain. So one of the reasons we decided to purchase a bank is it allows us to talk to individuals about credit card debt and mortgages and help in general to improve their financial lives as they're on the way towards retirement. And Nuveen, um, which may not be known to many of you, is headquartered in Chicago. And the reason we purchased them is um, their major asset management business is focused in on municipal bonds and a couple of other kinds of asset classes that are primarily focused on income. Uh, and so if you think about the big challenge in retirement is providing people with income for 20 or 30 years in retirement. And we saw that many of our uh, participants like having muni bonds, for example, and so mm -hmm. we thought it made some sense to have a really big asset management business that also has a focus on uh, income, which is similar to what we've been doing. Okay. So when, when you think about TA, how does it compare to other uh, firms in the financial industry? Are you, are you tracking along with the, other, with, with the, with the rest yeah. of the market, or are you, you guys uh, separating yourselves uh, from the market? Well, a couple of things are, are happening for us. Um, first, you have to understand that in the world of asset management, most folks think of uh, mutual funds, and we are one of the 10 or 12 largest mutual fund managers. A lot of folks think of uh, different asset classes, um, treasury securities, et cetera. But one of the things that differentiates us is that we also are one of the largest in what's called alternatives. Um, and so think of real estate, think of timber, think of agriculture. Um, these are very important uh, asset classes. They're not correlated. Their cycles aren't the same as the cycles with the equity markets. So one of the things that differentiates us is we're one of the few, I think we're the only, that brings together scale and mutual funds and fixed income investments and munis, and then equally big in agriculture, timber, and real estate. To give an example what I mean by equally big, um, we are the largest grower uh, of wine grapes in California. All right. Um, uh, it's a good thing that it's not appropriate to serve uh, wine <laughs> at, at lunch. Um, but for those who want to support the retirement of, you know, a faculty member at Wabash, <laughs> uh, if you drink responsibly, you know, one little glass of California wine, you are uh, providing some support for Greg and his colleagues at Wabash <laughs> in their retirement. We are the second or third largest owner of real estate. We are the fourth or fifth largest owner of timberland in the world. So one of the things that distinguishes us is, is um, the diversity that we have. The other thing is that we have been recognized uh, time and time again uh, for uh, superior performance. Uh, we've won what's called the Lipper Award, which is sort of like the Academy Awards for uh, mutual fund performance many, many years in a row. Uh, so I think we're distinguished on uh, diversity mm -hmm. uh, and performance. And the final thing is an industry that's not growing. We were uh, the second fastest growing mutual fund complex last year in terms of uh, net flows in. So two or three things that really distinguish us from the rest of the industry. Okay. Well, we've talked a little about the industry. Let's talk a little bit about the macro economy. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I think about it is about half the people in the world over the next, you know, are looking out over the next, you know, couple of years, 19, you know, th this year and next year. About half the people think things are going to be great. About half people think things are going to be terrible. The other half of people agree that it's going to be, you know, both of them. So, you know, it's somehow what's going on in the future is not really adding up. What, what are your views about the macro economy over the next couple of years? Well, first, let's uh, recognize that Greg's a great economist because, as with any good economist, he's got one half, one half, and one <laughs> half. So the three halves of the world. Um, so count us in that group. That's right. So I think we're, what we believe, um, and what I believe certainly is, is mm -hmm. two separate things, but they're related. First is we've gone through a period, a remarkably long period of robust growth in the U.S. and, and globally. Um, uh, by June this year, uh, this expansion that we've been experiencing will be the longest in economic history in the United States. So that's a pretty amazing story. Similarly, uh, this month, roughly speaking, um, the, the equity rally uh, will reach 10 years as well. And so we're coming uh, to, at the tail end, but not, let me be clear about what I mean by tail end, of a very, very long run. So what do we see going forward? Well, we believe that both the U.S. economy and the global economy will continue to grow over the next few years, but probably at a slower rate. 
than has been historically the case, or the, the case over the last few years. Um, and that's uh, for a number of reasons. One is some of the stimulus that uh, has existed from central banks, something Greg and I have in mm -hmm. common, is probably going to be a little less going forward. Secondly, here in the U.S., uh, we had a, a burst of stimulus um, that helped drive the 2018-2019 growth. That's probably all the models show that tailing off. And so we expect the U.S. to continue to grow, but not as rapidly as it has uh, in the past. Uh, similarly, we see Europe being you know, challenged a little bit more. Uh, already some signs of European growth slowing a little bit. Uh, and China also has been slowing just a little bit. So we see a picture that's not quite as rosy, but not um, uh, com completely downbeat either. What does that mean for markets? Um, I think, and we think the markets will continue to have some room to advance, but probably a lot more volatile uh, and unlikely to see the kinds of returns in equity markets over the next two or three years that we saw the last three or four years. So the kind of volatility and maybe slowing and uncertainty that we saw in October, November, uh, and December might be a bit more on the horizon. Though I noticed that today, contrary to what I expected, there's a lot of green. Most market indices seem to be higher. So mm. I would take my great bold forecast with a really big grain of salt <laughs> um, because I didn't even call today's market right. right. Um, but I, I think what that means for individuals is um, keep a long-term perspective. You know, don't panic if there's volatility. And just be mindful of you know, how you think about your risk profile against this potential outcome or forecast that I've put forward of maybe a little bit more up and down, a bit more turbulence than we've experienced uh, in, the, in the distant past. Well, you know, one of the biggest players in the markets now turns out to be the Federal Reserve, something that, uh, you know, you were in the leadership of. I was uh, much lower down on, on the totem pole when I was at the Fed. Well, you know, so the, so the monetary policy takes up a lot of, you know, takes up a lot of room in, mm -hmm. in markets right now. What, what do you think is the outlook for, for monetary policy, and, and how do you see monetary policy evolving over, you know, over that same kind of horizon? Um, and so I think the, the Federal Reserve has uh, been very much focused in on being much more transparent. It's one of the things that, yeah. that started when we were there mm -hmm. and has continued. Mm -hmm. And so to some degree, you know, the, the answer to the question of the outlook for monetary policy is exactly what they're saying, which is... The Fed has been watching the economy. Uh, uh, Jay Powell gave an interview, I guess, this last night on 60 Minutes, mm -hmm. in which he basically said the economy is doing, doing pretty well, and he said we seem comfortable, he seems comfortable with this, what's called the stance of monetary policy, where it right. stands now. Uh, and the Federal Open Market Committee, which is the committee that makes the policy decisions, has said, quote, they're going to be patient, uh, uh, which means basically I think they're watching to see if they need to move rates one way or the other. What's been interesting um, is that six months ago, certainly nine or 10 months ago, they were certain they were gonna to continue to raise rates. Right. Mm -hmm. They were thinking about raising rates two, maybe three times this year, as you recall. Mm -hmm. And then it got to the end of the year, and that certainty seems to have gone to a bit of uncertainty. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is um, if you interpret the way market, uh, fixed income markets are signaling there's starting to be a little bit of tone, uh, well, is the Fed going to raise or is the next move maybe lower? Um, and so I think we're in a period where patience is the right thing. They're trying to understand how the U.S. and global economy are going to unfold. And I think markets, and they are trying to figure out, do they keep interest rates where they are? Do they raise them a little bit? Do they lower them? Mm -hmm. And not yet clear. Yeah. Not yet clear. Now, there, there's <clears throat> definitely some uncertainty there, and I agree with you. It has changed since uh, the end of the calendar year. Uh, but you know, one of the things you mentioned before is about how, how volatile the world is, and now when we see the Fed is perhaps on a trajectory that's not going to be raising rates as, as or, or normalizing rates as perhaps they suggested they might, you know, we have investors out there who are trying to help finance their retirements. You know? mm -hmm. So what does retirement look like in a, in, in a low interest world, particularly when there's a little bit of volatility thrown in there just for some fun? <laughs> just for some fun. <laughs> um, so let me set a context for retirement and then, then uh, provide the best answer I can to your question. Mm -hmm. The first thing we have to recognize when we talk about retirement is that the retirement of the folks in this room, regardless of what your age is, be you, you know, 70 or, or uh, you know, 27, is going to be quite different than what people imagine retirement was going to be 40 or 50 or 60 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly 100 years ago. 
Um, and the reason is that we are all experiencing in the U.S. and globally, but in the U.S. and particularly relevant to this room, uh, an increase in what's called longevity. So our life expectancies because of health and, and, and diet and other things, medicine and technology, are all getting you know, a little longer. Uh, and so the average individual now, the male in, in this room who is about 65 years old, uh, has a good chance of living to be about 85, more than 50-50 shot, and uh, females of the same age, 65, have a shot at living to be uh, 86, 87, 88. Um, and uh, people often ask, well, why is it that women's life expectancy is longer than men's? And the answer is because they deserve it. <laughs> so, just, just, to be, just to be clear on that point. Um, and so, you know, if you're in a space where you, one might think of uh, retirement as being 20 or 30 years, not 10 or 15, there are two or three uh, issues that emerge. One is, you know, when do you actually want to start retiring? Well, there's an opportunity for people, not everybody, but people who have uh, sort of white collar kinds of jobs, not heavy physical blue collar, pink collar labor, right. to work a little longer. And so one should think about that. Then Greg asked the question, well, in a world of low interest rates and a lot of volatility, how do you think about providing income? Right. Um, and the answer goes back to a couple of points I made. One is you really have to be more diversified mm than used to be the case. So our grandfathers probably thought and were told, well, and when you're in retirement, you only want sort of fixed income. You want a safety and security of clipping coupons and, and getting payments off of, off of um, uh, somebody else's uh, uh, debt obligations. For those in this room and going forward, the answer is you still want some exposure to equity. You probably want some exposure, even alternatives if you can get it. Uh, because you are going to have to deal with some ups and downs and because fixed income no longer pays very much, right. as much as it used to. Right. So the second part of how retirement is different, the first is it's going to be longer, and the second is that means you have to invest, or the average individual has to invest, with the notion of more equity maybe than expected um, and other kinds of asset classes you can get hold of them. Um, the third thing that actually mm -hmm. might be different and not yet clear uh, but, but Greg and I both know that one of the surprises over the last six, seven, eight years has been how low inflation has been. Right. Um, and you know, so this is an interesting mm -hmm. concept for those who are getting closer and closer to retirement because inflation has been one of those things that, that eats into the incomes of retired people. And so the third question is, well, do you plan for an era of lower inflation and what does that mean? And then the final point, and I'll stop, um, is the other thing that's really important as you get closer and closer to retirement and live in retirement in the modern world is the big uncertainty, and the big uncertainty is health care costs. Right. So plan for a longer retirement, keep broad diversity, recognize that inflation may sort of be your friend, but what's not going to be your friend is, is health care costs. And the final point I'd make is putting all that together most of the retirement economists say that you need to think about replacing about 70% of your pre-retirement income in retirement. Uh, it's not 20 or 30%, it's not 100%, but 70% is actually a pretty big chunk, and I think that surprises people to think about how much they're going to need for income in retirement versus what they made while working. Sounds like I'm going to have to keep working, Roger. So, that makes uh, two of us, my friend. That's right. Okay, us. we'll keep at it. Uh, last question about the economy. You know, the, you know, the, you know people, you know, the, the world has changed back and forth about how important government debt is. There was a time period when government debt was a huge concern. There was a time period uh, around the time you were the Fed one that you were actually running out of debt. There right. was a big Fed, you know, the, the Fed did a big, had a big conversation about how do you conduct monetary policy when there's not much debt. Right. Well, it's back. So we, yes. we have plenty of debt to work with now. Some of it the Fed owns, of course, but uh, uh, holds on his books. So, so w what are your views on the current level of government debt and, and the, the, the challenges that, that might bring to us going forward? If it, is it overblown, underblown, or, or somewhere in between? Um, always the answer if you're an economist is somewhere in between. Okay, right? there you go. Um, so a couple of interesting things have happened. One is we have gone from a place temporarily um, towards the end of the Clinton years when we actually had balanced budgets and surpluses uh, to now running you know, lots of debt. Now, originally we ran deficits um, because that was the way the federal government helped to stimulate the economy after the crisis. More recently, we've uh, had some tax changes and other things that have led to us now running debt at about a trillion dollars a year, um, which is a very, very large number. Yet, 
in spite of all that, something that Greg said comes back into play here, interest rates are still remain very, very low. So there's a little bit of a conundrum of, gee, a lot of debt, uh, deficits getting bigger in the U.S. and everywhere else, uh, but for some reason interest rates haven't adjusted. So the economics profession and the, the investing profession are trying to figure out that conundrum. That's relatively short term. Longer term, I think debt actually does matter. So that, that short term thing says, gee, markets are acting as though all this deficit and debt don't really seem to matter because interest rates are low. So we'll see. Long term, I think it absolutely does matter. And the reason is uh, back to the, the aging population. So what's going to happen um, over the next 10 or 15 years is we're going to have to figure out Social Security, we're going to have to figure out Medicare, uh, to some degree Medicaid. Um, we're going to have to pay interest on in all of this debt that's outstanding. And you know, the U.S. is going to be in a position where uh, we're going to have to borrow more and more if we're not careful. And so starting in a place with a really high debt burden already and getting higher, I think is sort of problematic. So to summarize this answer, yeah. even if you're not worried about the debt today, tomorrow, the deficit in the short term, if you think about the U.S. and intermediate to long term, I think one has to start to say, wait a minute, we need to save some of our borrowing, borrowing capacity to pay for some future challenges that we know are going to occur, all because of demographics, basically. Okay. So there's a, maybe a little uh, ray of hope out there. I know a lot of, we'll kind of switch out of that and talk about a couple other things. The big one that, um, you know, in terms of the concerns that people have out there in the world that you might, you'll have some insight on is kind of the, the, you know, the, 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 the future of work. You're, mm -hmm. you're on the board at Alphabet, which is, you know, one of those great providers of artificial intelligence. So, you know, how, how do you think jobs are going to look like in the future? Because, you know, according to what you said earlier, I've I got to keep working for a while. So, <laughs> uh, but how, what's, the, what's the future of work going to look like? It, it is a great concern to people. Um, so I think the future of work, which is, is going to be quite similar and quite different simultaneously, if, if one can imagine that. So a number of the jobs that we currently have are clearly going to be displaced um, by new technologies. And you know, famously, people talk about truck drivers and autonomous vehicles. That's some of the jobs. Um, I think the total displacement story, I think, gets relatively overblown. Right. There are very, very, very few jobs out of the, the, literally the millions of jobs that exist in this country and, and around the world that can be completely displaced by new technologies. There's also a, another group of jobs that really can't be touched by technology whatsoever. Right. Uh, and these jobs tend to be more uh, service and oriented, where it's really all about EQ and experience, et cetera. And then my old colleagues at McKinsey, my former colleagues at McKinsey, um, think about 60% of jobs are going to be influenced by technology in one way or the other. And the way to think about that is what technology does really well is it allows uh, analytical activity to go on without mistake, you know, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, uh, recognizing things. Uh, and so I think what really is going to happen with the future of work is many of us are going to be working in a world that's um, uh, supported by, where we're made productive by animation or, or, or new uh, technology, automation, AI, et cetera. A few of us are going to be in jobs that are complete risk being displaced, and some of us are going to be in jobs where you barely know that a technology revolution has taken place. Mm. So that means that we should all be planning for some change, but very few of us should be planning in a mode of, you know, the sky is falling. It's really more how do I tool myself up to work in an environment that's being complemented, supplemented, supported by artificial intelligence, robotics, um, uh, you know, AI, new data, big data, that kind of thing. Right. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, it sounds, sounds, uh, sounds like, uh, you know, a, a pretty reasonable uh, understanding of, of the influences on uh, technology and, uh, and, and the future of work. And a lot of times, you know, that, that has a big impact on higher education. Right. Now, you were one of the co-chairs of the Academy of Arts and Sciences Commission on the future of higher education. So, and, and now technology is a big piece, and, and how do young people learn about technology? And, and, and the way that, that I think about it is, you know, there, there was the historic you know, view that higher education taught students to seek the truth. 
And there seems to be a lot of pressure now for higher education to create, you know, to, to help you find your path in the, as a mm -hmm. profession. How, how do you see that playing out? And, and what kind of, you know, conversations, understandings do you have about that based on your, uh, your, 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 your co-chairing of the committee uh, or just in, 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 in the world that you see out there? So I think the answer to this one is, is what I would describe as a both-and answer. So mm -hmm. higher ed still needs to teach younger people, you know, some fundamental critical thinking, teamwork, empathy, seek the truth mm -hmm. kinds of skills, um, uh, and, and frankly, uh, mindset towards learning. And at the same time, needs to teach uh, those harder skills that, that we're going, they're going to need, younger people, for those entry-level jobs. The reason I say it's a both and is, if you think about a world in which there's a lot of AI and robotics and artificial intelligence, go back to what I said earlier, um, there are things that, that technology does really well. So if you are unfortunately diagnosed, somebody, you know, you go to the doctor, you have a, a CAT scan or x-ray, and the doctor says, boy, I see something, I'm not sure I like it. You probably want um, uh, AI-enabled uh, computer to read uh, an x-ray, an MRI, a CAT scan, because, you know, technology is really good at picking up fine distinctions. You probably know that, um, uh, looking at slides of, of cancerous cells, AI has been much better at identifying precancer than individuals. On the other hand, um, uh, if, the, if the story is not positive, you don't want a computer to say, unfortunately, you only have 24 hours to live. <laughs> right? So the reason I, I put it that way is so that you have in mind that what, you, what education needs to prepare people for is the stuff that human beings do really well and figure out how to partner with technology. And what we do really well is empathy, communication, understanding, and where we can partner with technology is in the stuff that technology does well. And so higher ed needs to remind people of what it is that makes humans different, uh, and obviously better than machines, and skill them up to work with machines. And the reason I say this is we've gotten ourselves very excited about STEM, 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 everything's gotta be STEM. I actually think we need to balance and say, yeah, some has to be STEM, but we don't want to forget, you know, critical thinking, language skills, empathy, all those, the teamwork, all those things that make us human. Because those human skills, ironically, have become even more important in a world in which we are uh, supported by technology. Does that, does that make sense? There's a lot of answer in that, but it's a little bit of both and. Yeah, well, it, it is one bit. of the things that uh, higher ed, you know, does deal with on, you know, on a daily basis is how to, you know, both educate, you know, the individual, but also can continue to prepare them for a world uh, of, you know, where that's uncertain and where they right. might, you know, young people today will probably have 10 different jobs in their lifetime. Exactly and, right. you know, learning some technical pieces are good, but you better have uh, the ability to, to, to broaden that out I think that's uh, right. at, at a drop uh, of, of a coin. I wanted to switch up a little bit and talk a little about some things that are, you know, important to you and important to TIA. Uh, one is diversity is in, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, recently TIA has increased its focus on inclusion. Can you tell us, uh, you know, what you're doing about that at TIA and, and why that's important to the culture of TIA and, 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 and its mission? Sure. Well, it's actually uh, important to society overall, frankly. So this issue around diversity and inclusion um, is very important on a number of dimensions. One is there's more and more hard evidence that um, diverse and inclusive companies perform better. Um, there's a fair amount of research now uh, that shows that companies that have 35 to 40 percent female representation on their boards tend to perform better. Uh, these are publicly traded companies. Their stock tends to do better. Um, and so whatever else you may think, you want, we want to be successful. And if that means having diversity and inclusion, then that's important. We also think it's important because uh, we will be around for at least another 100 years, and we look out at society overall, and we expect an increase in diversity, and we want our company to reflect um, the markets that we work in. So we see that as being you know, quite important. Uh, and finally, um, we do find, and this is something that's been driven by um, more academic work, a fellow named Scott Page at University of Michigan, has written a number of books on, on systems. And it turns out that diverse systems are much more robust. Um, they withstand shocks a lot better. And so mm -hmm. since we have to be in business 
because we deal with life slavery for at least another 100 years, if being diverse and inclusive helps us to, be a, to withstand shocks better because you have different ideas, different approaches, different skill sets, then that's important to us. So there are a number of reasons why we think this is critical mm -hmm. to short-term and long-term success and viability for the company. And you know, it therefore helps us uh, succeed in our mission. So that's why this is so, so very important. And you've noticed, you know, the one thing I didn't say is we think it's sort of morally right. Um, <laughs> so I've taken sort of a business angle to it in addition to, you know, obviously the ethical angle to it. Okay. That's wonderful. Well, you know, that is part of your kind of your leadership DNA, Roger. And, and you know, you, people, you know, I, I've seen interv interviews with you before about, you know, what it was like to be, you know, the only, you know, Federal Reserve uh, adult in the room at 9-11. Everybody else was out of the, uh, out of the office, yeah, I mean, this, at least at the governor's level. And, uh, you know, and that was obviously a big thing. So, so what were the kind of leadership lessons that, that you've learned in your, in, in your very varied gr career? I don't know if you can distill it down to a couple, sure, of, a couple of things you'd like to share with people. Sure, I can distill it down to a very simple thing, which is if you want to be a leader, uh, the most important thing is that you um, engender followership, right? So if you look over your shoulder and no one's following you, by definition, you're not a leader. <laughs> um, and so, you know, my mindset, and it was, it was born out in 9-11, is what are the traits that it takes to be a leader? Um, and I think one of them is uh, you absolutely have expertise. Um, you know, folks don't really want to follow an amateur. Now, expertise can be technical. It could be you know, how an organization works. So on 9-11, um, fortunately, because of the things I'd done, I knew a lot about how payment system works and banks and a variety of other things. Right. And all that came into play. The second uh, trait that I think a leader needs to have is the ability to communicate, to articulate exactly where it is that you want people to go, what you want them to do. Um, and you know, around 9-11, we had not a huge amount, a small number of critical communications uh, that made it, that I think made a difference. Uh, most importantly, we reassured markets that we were going to be there and that they could continue operating. So, uh, uh, you know, the ability to, to articulate, you know, where you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, the third element, I think, is very much around making that place you want to go exciting, interesting, um, you know, responsive to challenge. And, and so, obviously, you know, that played in the 9-11. And then the fourth, is you actually have fortitude. You know, folks don't want to follow a leader who, as soon as things get a little rocky, the leader is the first one to panic. You know, you want a leader who's more of a shock absorber than a shock amplifier, and that obviously was you know critical on sure. 9/11. Yeah. Um, the other side of leadership that's come to my as I've been thinking about it. So those are four skills around mm -hmm. you know attracting followership. It also occasionally falls to the leader to think about you know the system overall and what might be good for the system even if, if it's not particularly popular on a day-to-day -day basis with individuals. Um, and so my friend Ken Chenault came to talk to me and others about leadership, and he phrased it as, you know, the leader has to help everyone confront reality and also give hope. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want you to think that, well, followership means being popular. That's the one thing I didn't say, because sometimes the leader has to say, look, here's the reality, folks. It's not as pretty as you'd like it to be, mm -hmm. yet here's the hope of the way forward. So those are some of the thoughts I have on leadership, and it all keys off the notion that you can't be a leader if no one wants to follow you. Okay. Well, that was terrific, Roger. I'm looking for some questions here. Has anybody brought forward some questions? I think we've... we've well, well, I'm waiting for them to be handed to me unless I've missed them here. Let, let me just uh, start with another. One of the things that's popular out there was, uh, what's it, modern monetary theory. This everyone is, knows what that is, right? Everyone knows what modern monetary theory, MMT, I don't, I'm not sure what, you know, uh, if it's uh, you know, a new energy drink or something out there uh, <laughs> that's out there for young people. Uh, can, you know, what do you I mean? That there's this, so there's a few out there that maybe, maybe government debt doesn't matter. Can, right. can you give just a little thumbnail sketch so, on MMT and, then, and, 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 and how you view that as a, as a macroeconomist? Okay, so for those who don't know, and I suspect there'll be some, modern monetary theory, as Greg has indicated, is this new idea, and we discussed this a little bit already, mm -hmm. that um, governments can print up as much or can borrow as much money as they want, they can spend as much as they want, not worried about how it gets paid for, and basically you know, run massive amounts of debt. Um, uh, this theory has come forward for a couple of reasons. One is an observation that Japan has actually been doing this. They've been running very large budget deficits for long, long, long periods of time, and yet their interest rates aren't very high. In fact, they're almost negative. 
The other reason this theory has come forward is um, a real sense that we need to make big investments in things like infrastructure and education, getting ready for the future. And every time we try to figure out, well, how do we pay for it, that sort of limits our abilities to do all the things we want to do. So there's a small set of economics that sort of says, you know what, this, anx this anxiety around the debt and our ability to, to, uh, to, to uh, spend as much as we want as a country, we should worry a lot less about it. Um, now, my view of this is unproven that this is something we want to do. And I saw recently an article, I guess, in The Economist magazine that said, you know, even if you think this is true, maybe what you should do is sort of experiment in a small country before you decide in the U.S. that we're going to run deficits for as far as you want. And so, you know, in lieu of having to say this is right or wrong, maybe the most pragmatic answer, and you can sense I try to be pragmatic in these things, is let's say, let's see if any other country manages to do this well right. before we adopt this as a thing we want to do. Uh, but count me as, you know, fairly skeptical that we shouldn't throw out hundreds of years of economics because <laughs> a new idea has popped up. Uh, because you and I have both been in economics long enough to see some new ideas pop up that get a lot of academic attention, and then they sort of fail in the test of the, of the real world. I would, I would worry a bit about this notion that we can just spend as much as we want and never have to pay for it. Uh, okay. I don't, I don't, it doesn't seem reality to so, me. So l l let me get just a couple questions here. The first one, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase it. Can, can you think of some practical solutions to quote unquote fix social security? This is one of the questions that oh, came sure. to the audience. Um, the word practical is tricky in that one. <laughs> so <laughs> let me tell you what I think the vast majority of, of economists, Republicans and Democrats, would agree on. Okay. And then we can figure out if they're practical. So one of the fixes is to increase the so-called retirement age, which is the age at which you can take full Social Security. That has been gradually rising over time um, um, because of something that Alan Greenspan and the commission did 20 plus years ago. Whenever I say you know, one of the solutions is to increase the full retirement age, all of my friends who do blue collar and pink collar hard labor kind of jobs say, well, you know, if I had to work another five years, I, I wouldn't survive. So even if we think about increasing the retirement age, we have to be sensitive to the different job categories there on the country. So that's, but that's one item. Right. Second item, frankly, um, all of you know that Social Security payments are so-called indexed to inflation. So every time in inflation goes up, Social Security beneficiaries get more. But we have to choose the index that we can use. And there's some indices that are more accurate reflections of inflation. So a more accurate indexing might be, might be helpful. Mm -hmm. The third thing, frankly, may well be that not all of us should get Social Security. Um, and um, that is, that's called basically being driven by wage or wealth or income. So we might actually think that some folks should not get quite as much Social Security. This is not true for lower income people, mm -hmm. but it's not sure why everyone needs to get you know, for Social Security. So there are two or three things that we could do. Now, so someone asked practical. You have to decide if any of those things are practical um, or more politically, politically feasible. But there are clearly some fixes that we could do before we get into trouble. OK. Uh, here's a question about financial literacy, something that's important both to you and to TIA, uh, CREF. Uh, uh, TIA, excuse me, the CREF was, was dropped. That was one of the other questions. It's a whole different branding conversation. I talked about it with Roger. So how do you teach kids about financial literacy? Is there anything you can recommend? Um, Sure. So I think you teach them about financial literacy by taking every opportunity to start with wherever they, wherever they are and just sort of inform them of, of activities and how the world works. So in my own case, um, I think my financial literacy at the kitchen table started when I was in the seventh grade. <laughs> um, uh, first, getting an allowance and what are you doing with it? Um, secondly, are you making sure you're saving some of it? Um, and, you know, just reminding people of that. Um, my father was a very unusual guy in that um, he entrusted me to start balancing the family check checkbook. This is back when people had checkbooks. Um, so we can't do this all today. Uh, um, but that was really important, starting in seventh grade. Um, uh, again, in my case, we had a teacher who had us uh, fill out the basic uh, income tax form, EZ. Um, so for folks who are willing to sort of educate their kids and show them how you do your tax returns, that's fine. 
but the essence of all this is you have to, in some sense, trust kids to understand money. Uh, and my experience is you have to trust them to understand your money, frankly. Okay. And not every family wants to do that. Um, a couple of other things that we could do, only about half the states require any kind of uh, uh, class in financial literacy to get a, a, a basic undergrad, a, a basic high school diploma. And so, you know, the other states could probably do some of that for sure. Um, and then I think we also have to work on teaching our teachers how to talk about financial literacy. So when I was at the Fed, mm -hmm. we had a, a game that we sent to all high school teachers or many high school teachers around the country. And we asked them, well, are you using it? And the vast majority of them didn't want to use it because they themselves had no financial literacy. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we have to sort of confront the fact that we adults, by and large, don't have the degree of financial literacy as called for. Okay, here's another question. So younger generations often think about investment and social good as opposites. How does TIAA think about using investment as a tool for social impact and public good? Oh, my goodness. So this question um, may have come from one of our own employees. I don't know. <laughs> so we are, That's right. it, we are well known for our position um, as uh, a leader, maybe in fact the leader in socially responsible investing. Um, we have the largest socially screened account in, in one of our CREF uh, accounts. Uh, and we think this is important because we also are starting to see a correlation between high scores around environmental, social, and governance matters mm -hmm. and you know, good economic performance. Um, we have, uh, as an example, for those, most of you don't, but in Barron's two weeks ago, uh, there was an interesting story about the one mutual fund, or one of the few, that had avoided um, the collapse of, of Kraft Heinz stock, and it turned out to be one of our accounts. And the reason that we had avoided that, that stock that took a big 20% dip, I think it was, mm -hmm. was because we didn't like the way they had put forth their corporate governance. Mm -hmm. So we believe um, that there's a positive correlation between environmental, social, and good governance and good long-term returns. Uh, and we are therefore turning our entire portfolio to think about socially responsible investing as an important part, or responsible investing as an important part of who we are and what we stand for. Oh, just to go back to the Social Security question, there's just a <clears throat> follow-up here. One of the things you didn't talk much about Social Security is about privatizing Social Security. Right. Is that, is that, a, uh, is, is that too complicated? I mean, is it, uh, or w do you think there would ever be, or could you imagine, or could you think of pathways in which part of what we think of as the public aspect of Social Security would ever have a privatized element to so, it? So, uh, I... Mm -hmm. uh, one might imagine it. Um, you recall the political uh, conversation when privatizing was first mentioned. So I think some of the conditions that have to exist before you privatize Social Security, one is you have to recognize that Social Security is the guaranteed retirement bedrock for millions of Americans. And so how do you have you know, sort of a government backstop in case things don't go so well? Because a lot of individuals look at financial services as being highly volatile, frankly, not necessarily trustworthy. And most folks, um, not folks in this room, but lots of folks, don't want to sort of put their bedrock savings into the hands of a private organization that might go up and down, et cetera. So that's one element that we have to think about. Uh, the flip side is, um, you know, Social Security at this stage is only invested in government securities. Uh, and so it's missing what we at TI do and what hopefully all of you do, which is have a component of your retirement investments uh, in, in, in uh, equities. Uh, but the, then the challenge is, well, how do you tell people that, you know, your, your retirement's going to be a little bit volatile? So I could imagine privatizing Social Security if we can get over those big issues of creating a bed, sense of bedrock security mm -hmm. and raising the degree of trust in whoever it is who's managing it. Um, though I don't think they would come to us. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, uh, and my company would not actually do it, I suspect, but <laughs> having, you know, a company that has 100 years history of doing retirement really well to be part of that team might well be, you know, a, a path forward here. But we'll see. I suspect we're not going to have that discussion anytime soon, because the last time we had it, it was very partisan, very difficult, and we ended up in a, in a place where I thought it was just had to come off the table. Okay. Well, I just got a couple of minutes left, but I just, you know, the, the final question I just want to ask you about, um, you know, kind of the U.S.'s place in the world, uh, you know, in terms of its economic advantage, disadvantage. Now, today's an interesting company in which that it's, it's you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's for U.S. 
you know, it's, it's U.S. based, but obviously you invest all over the world. Right. How, how do you see the U.S. A, as it compares to other country in terms of where it is in its future trajectory as, as, a, as an economic uh, generator of prosperity? Right. So, look, we have been the leading economy uh, for 150 years, more or less. Um, I, I see no reason why that can continue. And the reason I think it is likely to continue is unlike almost every other economy, we've got a couple of advantages that others don't. One is we've got a strong view about the rule of law and contract. Uh, and that's really important if you're going to have you know, a private sector capitalism, so to speak. Um, secondly, we also try to have a well-regulated economy. Uh, now, I emphasize we try to have because we're not always perfectly you know, sort of regulated. Uh, and third, we have a strong, strong belief in sort of transparency and understanding uh, what's going on. Uh, and then finally, we have had, historically, I think we still have the leading higher ed uh, system in the world. You know, the, our university have been attracting the best brains from around the world. So you put all that together, transparency, appropriate regulation, a real strong belief in rule of law and rule of contract, and the ability to educate one generation after another after another. And I think we ought to be, you know, really, really powerful for, for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. Um, we are, as you know, uh, now uh, in observing the rise of China mm -hmm. as uh, an alternative uh, economic power. You know, they've got some obvious strengths in terms of s scale and size and other things. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't have some of the things that we just talked about uh, in terms of rule of law and other things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it will be interesting to see. But, you know, given our strengths, we ought to be able to maintain this phenomenal position as an engine of growth an engine of wealth, an engine of ingenuity for long periods of time. The only other point I'd make is obviously we're also observing that as good and strong as our system is, we've got some elements of inequality, we've got some concerns about folks who are feeling that they're left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we do have to work at sort of repairing and revitalizing our system so that all of us are coming along on this great journey and it doesn't feel as though we have you know, a great society overall, but it's a lot better for some than it is for others, because I think that is a real challenge uh, in terms of keeping uh, this society together. So tell me, highly optimistic about America. I think we've got all the building blocks that are necessary, but let's not be complacent about our future, because we can obviously see that uh, even as great as our society is, we've made some, we have some challenges that, that obviously are front and center in the minds of many people. Well, let, let me just be the first, Roger, to thank you for an exceptional yeah. conversation. I appreciate your optimism and your, and, and your thoughtfulness on that one. We'll leave it at that. Everybody, thanks, everyone. Uh, well, thank you. With great thanks very much, Roger. Greg. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.